Be advised, this episode of Scams and Cons contains strong subject matter, including discussions of death and suicide. Death is... I tell you, I don't care how many dreams you hear, I don't care how many anguish cries. Death is a million times preferable to ten more days of this life. If you knew what was ahead of you, if you knew what was ahead of you, you'd be glad to be stepping over tonight. At its base level, scams are convincing some person or group to give the cons something they want. Usually it's money, but sometimes it's power. Often it's both. Today we're going to talk about cults. Cult leaders convince their marks to hand over their money, to hand over their lives. They detach the mark from their family and friends. They control them sexually. They assign them tasks that serve no purpose except to enrich the needs of the leader. The stories I'm going to tell you today are incredibly difficult to listen to, but you'll hear from people who've lived within cults and whose job it was to recruit new members. And, in the case of what you just heard, the voice of the leader of the People's Temple, who commanded 918 men, women, and children to take their own lives. A third of those who died were children. I'll tell you that story in a moment, but first I want you to understand what life is like inside a cult. Cult leaders and con artists share several psychological characteristics. They're narcissists. Usually we could just do an eye roll or play their game, especially if we work for one. Machiavellians are easy to identify, but we rarely see the depths of their schemes. We don't know what tales they've told to what people or what barriers they've erected to make things go their way. Then there are the psychopaths. If you've seen The Shining, Silence of the Lambs, or Sideshow Bob in The Simpsons, you get the idea of extreme psychopaths. Not all psychopaths are axe-wielding, typewriter-punching, yellow-skinned ghouls. Most are more subtle, and we're all grateful for that, especially since the people who measure such things say one in 100 people have psychopathic traits. They lie, are glib and superficial, manipulative, feel no guilt, are impulsive, irresponsible, and take no responsibility for their actions. My definition of a cult includes, uh, first of all, the founder uh, of the organization, um, who is usually authoritarian, often a narcissist, and uh, is typically considered charismatic. Uh, Secondly, there's an all-or-nothing belief system which requires complete devotion to the leader and includes a requirement that the person go through an indoctrination process so that they can uh, develop and stay on the path, whatever that person is offering them. And then third, there is always some type of exploitation, uh, whether that's financial, sexual, or just plain power abuses. That's Dr. John Yelalich, a researcher, author, and educator specializing in cults and extremist groups with a particular focus on charismatic relationships, political and other social movements, and issues of gender and sexuality. And did I mention she was in a cult? Not as an observer, as a member. Dr. Lalich is not some lost, naive soul who's ignorant in the ways of the world. I was 30 when I joined. I'd traveled around the world. I'd lived on an island in Spain for four years. I I got myself through college, but now I was, you know, this is what cults do. They kind of turn you into this dependent personality. So when you get out, you have to rebuild your your sense of self and your self-confidence and your self-esteem. Luckily, I found a great therapist and, and she really saved my life. And it begs the question, how did she come to join a cult? I was recruited out of a study group, which was kind of the front group for the organization. And then I was told there's this wonderful 
political organization that's going to bring about social change and we're going to fight racism and sexism and the leader was a woman which seemed great because at the time in the 70s most of the organizations were very sexist and led by men and women didn't have much of a role so that was very appealing but i really didn't meet the leader until i was in the organization and then when i did meet her i was like you but i was then convinced um that she was really this most brilliant person um who she was the new lenin you know we were going to make revolution and we had to worship and honor her and eventually i came to believe that i certainly believe i was scammed and that i was brainwashed although i know that that's a very controversial term i was often the person who led the training programs yeah not only was was i brainwashed but i brainwashed a lot of people <laughs> Dr. Lalich got it she knew she was indoctrinating people and she was good at it that's how she quickly moved up in the organization but where did she get those skills First of all, I come from a gangster family. Um uh, my dad was a bookie and ran illicit poker games, you know, back in the 50s and ended up in prison for tax fraud. He was my who I thought was my dad. It, just recently I found out that my actual birth dad was the head of the mafia in that town. <laughs> so, I suppose some of it is genetic. <laughs> I think that I I basically was able to read people really well and I was able to ask the right questions in recruitment meetings. So I think it was a combination of my, of what I already knew as a kind of a people person and then whatever training I got in the cult from from the leadership above me. Dr. Lalich spent a lot of time with the leader and it was the leader herself that sparked Dr. Lalich to leave. There were two momentous things that happened for me. One was that because I was in the inner circle, I was around the leader a lot and the other high-level members. The leader was an alcoholic, a severe alcoholic. Uh she was very vindictive. She was a megalomaniac, very harsh. I mean, we 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 did our best to actually keep her away from most of the membership. <laughs> So we would have to spend these weekends with her at the house in Bodega Bay and those were brutal traumatic times. We would have to keep up with her drinking. Um she wanted us to sing House of the Rising Sun that was her favorite song and we'd have to make up verses and if we couldn't make up a verse fast enough she'd hit you. Uh she would challenge the men to go upstairs and have sex with her. I mean they were horrible horrible sessions. and at some point i realized i couldn't do those anymore and so i would i would say i was sick my back had gone out i couldn't drive up there whatever i do it whatever i could to not go to those i didn't think it was a cult i just thought it was too horrendous i didn't want to be part of it cults have been with us for decades In the 1960s there was the Manson family who killed 9 people in hopes of starting a race war. Around 2017 there was Nexium. Founder Keith Renier was accused of running an abusive sex cult through a seminar company. A New York Times expose accused Nexium of running a cult called DOS or the Vow. The Times said the female members were branded, used as sex slaves, punished by their masters, and blackmailed. In 1865 after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, the Ku Klux Klan was formed in Pulaski, Tennessee. At its peak in 1924, membership was about 4 million members. It remains as one of the oldest surviving cults to this day. The list of cults is long, but now it's time to turn to the People's Temple, a group founded by Jim Jones that claimed more than 900 lives by suicide. He convinced them to drink a mix of flavorade, valium and cyanide to bring about their death. Death is 
I tell you, I don't care how many screams you hear, I don't care how many anguished cries, death is a million times preferable to ten more days of this life. If you knew what was ahead of you, if you knew what was ahead of you, you'd be glad to be stepping over tonight. Jim Jones said he didn't want the lives of 1,200 people on his hands, yet he not only led, but insisted that nearly 1,000 drink cups of poison. The taste of the grape drink was bitter, but mothers were coerced into feeding it to their babies. Wikipedia says cyanide poisoning symptoms include headache, dizziness, fast heart rate, shortness of breath, and vomiting. This phase may be followed by seizures, slow heart rate, low blood pressure, loss of consciousness, and cardiac arrest. Symptoms begin within a few minutes. Those that survive may have long-term neurological problems. I chose this story to tell because it shows the extreme power con artists can exercise over us. Someone can sell us fake art, fake a car accident, or show us fake credentials, but we don't die. Even if we're conned out of our life savings, we're still alive and hopefully have friends who can help us. But dead is dead. There are no do-overs. Con artists point out, and rightfully so, that they don't steal money. They convince suckers to willingly hand it over, and in most scams that's true. But Jim Jones intentionally lied to his followers and led them to their deaths. It was his goal all along. The clips I'll be playing for you are sometimes called the Jonestown Death Tapes. This was one of many seized by the FBI from a room called Radio Jonestown. Its broadcasts allowed people around the world to hear his message, with many traveling to Guyana to join the mission. Well, some everybody dies. <laughs> some place that hope runs out because everybody dies. I haven't seen anybody yet didn't die. And I like to choose my own kind of death for a change. I'm tired of being tormented to hell. That's what I'm tired of. Tired of it. Twelve hundred people's lives in my hands, and I certainly don't want your life in my hand. But I'm going to tell you, Christine, without me, life has no meaning. I'm the best friend you'll ever have. There's several different transcriptions of the tapes, along with some obvious edits. Applause is heard at inappropriate times, then vanishes. Crowds chant then their words fall away. It's not clear how the tapes were produced, but the FBI has concluded the voice belongs to Jones. I'm speaking here not as uh, the administrator, I'm speaking as a prophet today. I wouldn't step in this seat and talk so serious if I didn't know what I was talking about. If there's any way to call back the immense amount of damage that's going to be done, but I cannot separate myself from the pain of my people. The tape nears its end when Jones makes one last plea for his followers to drink the poison. Please, for God's sakes, let's get on with it. We've lived, we've lived as no other people have lived and loved. We've had as much of this world as you're going to get. Let's just be done with it. Let's be done with the agony of it. It's far, far harder to have to watch you every day die slowly. And from the time you're a child to the time you get gray, you're dying. It's honest, and I'm sure that they'll they'll pay for it. They'll, they'll pay for it. This is a revolutionary suicide. This is not a self-destructive suicide. So they'll pay for this. They brought this upon us, and they'll pay for that. The goal of scams and cons is to take you behind the scenes of a scam to show you how it works. It's usually something clever and someone always lose something of value. In this case, the scammer wanted people to willingly hand over their lives. Before I wrap up, there's one more comment Dr. Lalich made that I want to share. 
What's important to understand about charisma is that charisma is a social relationship. Charisma is not a trait inherent in someone. You're not born with charisma, right? You may be born uh, as a glib talker. Uh, you may be born with the ability to kind of read people and know where to push buttons. But charisma is something that's given to you by your audience. And once people consider you charismatic, then that sets up this power imbalance. Because if I think you're charismatic, then that means you're special. You're better than me, right? You're my superior. What caught my attention is her comment that charisma is something that's given to you. That's a con artist's superpower. They bring a sucker into the fold, make them feel good, and assure them they're making the right decision. The sucker then bestows charisma on the con artist. The assimilation is complete. All that's left is for the sucker to hand over their money or their lives. Fortunately, there are people like Dr. Lalich who escape and recover their lives, but there are those rare times when they don't. None of us is safe or immune from scams, and we all have vulnerabilities, but that doesn't mean we're destined to be suckers. Our superpower is that no matter what we're told, we always have a choice, and usually that best choice is to talk with people you trust about the commitment you're about to make. Your future and maybe your life could depend upon it. A successful con seduces a sucker into a world where their dreams can come true. Power and great riches are within their grasp. This magic casts a spell that leads its audience to hand over all their money to scammers who vanish before the sucker realizes it was all an illusion. If you enjoy the podcast, please help us out by telling your friends and encouraging them to listen. Scams and Cons is available wherever podcasts are found and at scamsandcons.com. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Just search for Scams and Cons. Lastly, if you could head over to Spotify and leave us a five-star rating, it'd be really appreciated. Spotify listeners are more than half our audience, so it makes a difference. We'll be back in two weeks. Thanks for listening.